Hey, what's up everyone, Nick here, and it is a sad day in the world of track and field. The world's fastest man for the last few years, the American sprinter, sprint legend Christian Coleman, he is banned for two years, meaning he will miss next year's Olympic Games. And it's not because he tested positive. This man is tested probably more than most athletes in and out of competition. I guarantee Christian Coleman was tested many, many times. No, the reason he's serving a two-year ban is because he missed three out-of-competition tests in a 12-month period. Now, the purpose of this video is not to discuss uh, Christian Coleman's case. He is going to appeal. It's not to discuss you know, what athletes I think are clean and dirty. That is not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is to explain to you how the out of competition testing takes place, how I was tested, and how easy it is to miss one of those tests. Now, I ran professionally for 12 years, and I was in what's now known as USADA's registered testing pool. Not every athlete that competes professionally is in this pool, but if you're making teams, you know, if certainly if you're one of the fastest people in the world as Christian Coleman was, or as I was for a few years, you are in this registered testing pool, and there are things that are expected of you when you're in that pool. Now, first of all, you are required to submit uh, a calendar, a quarterly update of where you're going to be for that quarter. So the 15th, I believe it's 15 days before the end of the current quarter, you're required to go online, uh, I believe it's usada.org, and you update your whereabout filing. So, for example, on December 15th of 2020, an athlete in that pool will be required to go to usada.org and say where they're going to be for the next three months. Now you're thinking, that's not that hard. Uh, all you got to do is look at your calendar, where you're going to be, and I agree. It, for the most part, it's not that hard to say where you're going to be on a macroscopic scale, right? I'm going to be based out of Eugene, Oregon, but I will be traveling to this training camp for these dates. Easy. Now, it gets a little bit harder when you dig into the nitty-gritty. Not only are you required to say where you're going to be for those three months, you're also required to provide a 60-minute window each day where you are expected to be at an address that you provide. So, for example, when I was doing this, I would say just as default, just as, as default to be safe, I'm going to be in Springfield, Oregon, where my home is based, for every single one of those days, and you can find me there from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. That is, you know, 99% of the time, maybe not 99% of the time, but most of the time, that is exactly true, right? I'm going to be there for those days, for those hours. Now, let's say I was going to a training camp in Flagstaff. I'd say, okay, for these dates, I'll be in Flagstaff, and my one hour will change. It'll still be the 5 a.m. to 6 a.m., but this new address will be where I'll be at. Pretty easy, right? Yes and no. During that hour, you are required to be at your location, but sometimes, let's say something comes up. Let's say um, I want to train. You know, maybe I wake up early and I decide to go to the gym. It's not the end of the world that most DCOs, doping control officers, have your phone number and they will call you and say, hey, we're at your house. Um, you know, can, can you come by and give us a sample? More often than not, that you know, if that happens, you just drive back and you give them a sample. Uh, most DCOs are that I've worked with. I've known many DCOs. They're very friendly and they want to help you. They want to get a sample. One because they get paid when they collect the sample, um, and two because they love the sport and they want to make sure it's a clean sport. And, and that's why they've decided to get into this uh, crazy world of, of doping and, and testing. But let's say something else happens. Let's say you know it's Saturday night and you go out and have a few pops and you wake up in somebody else's bed. Well, then you're not where you're supposed to be and maybe your phone's dead or maybe your phone's off and you're going to miss that call. Well, in that case, you're going to get what's called uh, a failure to provide a sample or a whereabout uh, filing failure. And you get three of those in a calendar year, right? In, in, in not in a calendar year, but in a 12-month cycle. So the USADA, WADA, the testing bodies, they understand that things do happen that sometimes we do miss fail to announce where we're going to be or we make a mistake and and so you get three right three strikes you're out now i was the kind of athlete that took this really seriously right i knew that i wanted to one be a champion for clean sport and so i said test me whenever you want like you can test me anytime day or night and they can they can come to you your house you know outside of that one hour they can come at three in the morning and you have to provide a sample a sample could be blood it could be urine it's whatever they ask for you got to give it to them. Now, I took this really seriously, and yet still, over the course of my career, I had missed tests. 
In fact, there was one period, I want to say it was around 2013 when I was ranked number two in the world, um, where I was getting tested a lot. And I did actually have two missed tests within a 12 month window. So you can imagine I'm sitting here on thin ice knowing that if I get one more missed test, I will have three and I will have to sit out for two years. That's just, we know, we know that as athletes. I was so nervous. I had my mom texting me every time I traveled. I had my agent texting me every time I traveled. I had my coach reminding me daily, did you update, did you update, did you update? That's what elite athletes have this team around them for. So there is not just you know one person trying to make sure that this thing keeps running. I know Christian has a team and I'm as disappointed as I am in Christian because ultimately this rests on his shoulders. The team failed here too. So. It's sad. Um, it's the reality of our sport. Our sport is dirty. You know, there are a lot of athletes that cheat that don't do it right. And it's sad for the rest of us who are clean. Um, and it ultimately, I will say this, I kind of alluded to it just a minute ago. It is the athlete's responsibility to take this seriously. It is the athlete's responsibility to update their filing, to provide samples when requested, to not dodge DCOs. DCOs are our friends. Um, I, my heart goes out to Christian, but I'm just not that empathetic because he knew the consequences of his actions. So, you know, I hope we get to watch Christian again, but uh, I'll leave you guys with this. Any of you young athletes out there that are in the testing pool, update your damn wear about filings. Like, it's not that hard. I managed to do it for 12 years. Uh, make sure that we keep this sport clean, right? One of the beautiful things about track and field is that when we watch athletes step out there, you know, we, we agree that the playing field has been leveled. And if there are athletes out there that are cheating, and unfortunately there are, um, then, then it loses some of that magic. So there's one other thing I want to do. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do it in this video because it's run a little bit long. I want to tell you what the process is like when those do doping control officers come to your house. The process of collecting these samples is ridiculous. So if you guys get this video to a thousand likes, I will make another video explaining in detail what it is like to provide a sample to these DCOs. I'm telling you, it's invasive. It's embarrassing at times. It is, it's absurd. You're going to want to hear this. I'll see you guys next week.